Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. I want to thank you for joining us on this first episode back from Thanksgiving. Greg Kenny, I hope my, my assistant and very dedicated cameraman who is currently my Orphic assistant. Again, I hope that we're, uh, this is a good word, Greg. You are my Orphic assistant. Uh, Greg, uh, hopefully we didn't all indulge too much on the good old uh, Thanksgiving turkey there, but mine was pretty good. So today we are moving into an interesting airplane. People say, oh, this airplane is not a warbird. It actually is, for those of you, it is. Warbirds come in all shapes and sizes. And this particular airplane is uh, one of the more uh, unique aircraft that has made its way uh, through the annals of warbird history. But first, I have to address, we're uh, doing a large yellow airplane, and I have to address, if I can find them, the hat that Greg has so dignified given me today. Of course, this could be a short takeoff and landing hat, perhaps, Greg, just like this airplane, but this is the yellow bird. So I want to thank Greg for coming up with, you know, I keep thinking he's going to run out of, here's the toss off the camera, nice catch. I keep thinking that he's going to run out of um, these hats, you know, that I hopefully what I agreed to isn't going to come back and haunt me. But so far, there goes one of those fine aviation products out there. Again, we're working outdoors. Um, that he's going to run out of hats, but that just simply hasn't happened. So today, to my right, is a very proud product of de Havilland, Canada, the DHC-2, or affectionately known as the Beaver. Now, the Beaver is a product of really a kind of an ingenious product, if you think about it, and that is that de Havilland at the end of the war was, and correctly surmised, that aircraft, military aircraft production was going to go off a cliff, which it did. We just didn't need them. And not only that, we had a gazillion, and by the way, Greg, that is an official term, gazillion. We had a gazillion of these just ex-military airplanes running around. They were super cheap. The military was trying to scrap them. And so they're going, well, what's the next market going to be? So de Havilland was thinking about, okay, the civilian market, and what are we going to do? And this is that product. Now, how did they get there? Well, they got there, and I, I hope I don't screw up this guy's name. This is a great name, by the way. Punch uh, Dickens was hired by de Havilland. Punch, his mother must have hated him, right? Punch, Punch was hi um, hired by de Havilland to look at the uh, post-war market. And when he went out and did his marketing surveys, what came back was they needed something that was short takeoff and landing, uh, that had a lot of utility, and that was economical to operate. So they messed around a little bit with a prototype. Uh, this airplane first flew in uh, 1947, and it was introduced in 1948. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm going to fly a beaver here, which has a couple of snags on. If you'd care to go along with me, why, come and see what it's like. I'd like that very much. All right. I'm going to see that it'll fly hands off. See that the wings will stay level without my hands on. You sure you can do this, eh? Well, I, I think so. It should be trimmed all right. I'll just see. But in the production and the design, when they got to final production, they actually extended the wing a little bit. And then there was another thing. The original power plant on the engine did not really make sense. So they went up to, they managed to get some surplus uh, Pratt & Whitney 450 horsepower engines. And that's what eventually ended up on the airplane. When they made that change to the airplane, all of the engineering, and sometimes that happens, and it happens with a lot of our airplanes uh, you, with, that we've talked about, you know, they make one or two design tweaks, 
and then the airplane, everything gels, everything makes sense. And that's what happened with this airplane. What they got was an airplane that had tons of power. Um, it could take off and land on short, rugged field. Really nice clearance with the landing gear. We've got a wide stance. Now, to my left is the steerman, and we've talked about the steerman being a little bit square, squirrely on that gear, and Greg can pan over and look at it. But we widened out the stance and made the, the angle, the, uh, the angle of attack on the gear a little bit wider, and so the airplane had a lot more stability. Now, the other thing that, had, that the Beaver had to be able to do because remember, this is a utility or cargo airplane. It could carry seven people or so in uh, different configurations. But I'm going to move over here, and Greg can get a shot of this when we do the walk around, but it had that big door. You could get a 55-gallon drum of fuel up into that cargo compartment. So you had a really large door. So you could seat a lot of people. You could carry about 2,000 pounds of cargo. And what did we have? We suddenly had, with this wide wing, wide stance, really good engine, large door, we had an airplane that was the quintessential bush plane. You could go in short strips, it could, it could uh, short landing and take off really well. The wing had high lift, it was a high wing, really good, uh, you know, under the undercarriage clearance, uh, excellent visibility, and you had a pretty good range. So you had an airplane that made a whole bunch of sense. So when the airplane came in in the late 40s, uh, there were quite a few of them that were sold. The sales actually started off a little bit slow, but they started to pick up. And then the Korean War happened, and then the Vietnam War happened. And what did we end up with, Greg? We, had, we went out and we, uh, we went out and got uh, the military. The United States Army uh, went out and bought a whole bunch of these. I think it was around 900, a little bit more of that. They bought these airplanes, bought a number of these airplanes. As I said, I think 1650 were produced. So if you think about that, the military orders, which is kind of interesting because, as I just said, de Havilland was looking at really a post war market, but the military ended up picking it up. Um, they ended up uh, buying a number of these airplanes. The, the aircraft had hard points in the wings, you could actually uh, fire smoke. Uh, there were smoke and rocket canisters that could hang under this wing, this big wing, and you could uh, shoot at bad guys. Although, to be perfectly honest, I think the cruising speed was 145 miles an hour. This is not an airplane I would want to get into. It had no armor or any of that. I would not want to get this airplane into a situation where you were taking hostile fire. But that did happen, or you were marking enemy positions and so on and so forth. If you look at the operator list, on this airplane, there was a number of operators. It is truly global. It was operated all over the world, but the the United States military, United States Army, did most of them. Now, interestingly enough, uh, nine of these uh, aircraft are still serving as search and rescue airplanes with the Civil Air Patrol. Can you believe that, Greg? I thought that was kind of interesting. And then there are two of them that are uh, used by the United States Navy that are still in use to, to teach lateral deceleration on landings, if you can think about that. So they actually still use them as, as teaching tools. Now the aircraft, after it got done with its military service, as what happens with a lot of these airplanes, it moved into uh, civilian hands and you have a lot of them flying up in Canada, like this airplane, uh, and in Alaska that are uh, being used to haul cargo and supplies to really rough areas. And this kind of fits, you know, we just did the Catalina, and our Catalina, our Super Catalina, actually uh, did a, had a lot of work in Alaska. This airplane, this type, is no different. Now, what I want to do today is I'm going to move over to my Stage 2. I am, a, I am frightened of my Stage 2 today, Greg. This is really scary. Lester is back. Lester's fixing. By the way, Lester's fixing's. This huge uh, bottling company 
wherever Lester is, and Melba, I think she's there too, um, is not a sponsor of the program. This one, <laughs> this, this is very scary, and this is peanut butter and jelly soda. Where in the heck do you come up with this stuff? Um, Lester's, this product does not have a uh, sell-by date. It has all of the usual suspects in that it's packed with sugar and uh, perhaps peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter and jelly. Sorry about that. No enunciation today. My Orphic assistant. Of course, I'm going to be using the non-magnetic magnetic can opener again to make this opening. At some point, there we go. Look at that. Look at that. Am I ingenious or what? It works. Very good. Now, the, uh, the folks I want to salute today is the uh, Canadian aircraft industry. Uh, this airplane is completely outside. You know, when, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. This or peanut butter and jelly soda. But this is absolutely out of the box thinking. If you think about it at the time uh, when this airplane came into inception in the late 40s, uh, a lot of these manufacturers were facing basically oblivion because they built their entire company on these huge military orders. This is a great example of the Canadians coming up with an idea and then figuring out how to make it work. This design was recognized in 1987 as one of the top Canadian engineering feats of the 20th century, if you can believe that or not. So with that, I'm going to knock back my peanut butter jelly soda. Yeah, Greg is watching me intently. Wow. Oh, oh no, no. But to all those Canadian engineering folks, I'm gonna do one more of these, but oh, this is either bad, it's either gone bad, or I can't believe they're selling this. Let me put it that way. Ooh, that takes no uh, push for me to put that down. That is, oh my goodness. That is, that's disgusting. That really is. Greg is laughing pretty hard. You're going to have to come out in front here one of these days and do one of these and feed me this nasty stuff. So, uh, as I said, the beaver lives on. Uh, the um, DHC-2 in, uh, in private hands, uh, it can be uh, flown on floats. rough strips on on these larger tires uh, Viking I believe purchased the rights to manufacture all the parts I think it was from Bombardier so you can still get parts for these airplanes and believe it or not there's even you know these radial engines and we operate a number of them over time both the radials and the v12 engines that we put in the fighters are all going to be a bigger and bigger challenge as that uh, industrial complex that supports all that fades away, that, that military and the post-war industrial complex. This aircraft, what some entrepreneurs have done, is actually put a, uh, a turbo and made this into a turboprop. Which
change the performance a little bit. I think there are two of those out there, Greg, that are operating, but uh, there may be more. So I may be wrong with that. But the the re-engineering on this, because a, a tough, rugged airplane going into remote places is never going to go away. So uh, you can probably, and the turbo uh, turboprop will have a lot um, longer life before time before overhaul, and the availability on parts is going to continue to to drive these radials probably eventually completely out of the use of the airplane. But for the next five years or so, uh, we probably are still going to be able to operate these radials. So a turboprop version is probably in this airplane's future. It is a great not only cargo airplane, but sightseeing airplane. Uh, it is, you can see post-war, one of the things about it, the design feature is it's all metal. Control surfaces are all metal as we've kind of moved away from the last vestiges of, of fabric airplanes. So I want to sum up in that uh, we salute the Canadians and we think that they have built an absolutely fantastic product, but I would be remiss, I would be remiss if you're going to get in your DHC-2, and you're flying in Alaska, Greg, what do you need? You need a jacket. And why not go out to our site? This, for the holiday time, this is a great jacket. And for the kids, especially the kids that, that are want to love airplanes, and this one uh, is more of a Top Gun, but it's got Airshow USA on it and everything. We have these in various sizes on the websites. Now, for you dads out there, this is a double, uh, or moms, this is a, a double product placement, and then I am wearing our newest fleece that we carry in the shop as well. And it even has the new uh, 25th anniversary logo with, a, with Stealth A33 on it. So go out to the website, either treat someone you love, one of those little kiddos to a jacket, or even treat yourself or an adult in your family one, one of these wonderful fleeces. But I want to thank you for joining us today. Remember... Go out to that uh, YouTube channel, hit that like button, smash, us, smash the subscribe button, and like us on Facebook. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Also, remember, it's around the holidays towards the end of the year. We can always use that donation. So go out to the webpage and hit that donation. Thank you very much. Have a great day.